I am going to be talking with Marley Sahuna. She is extraordinary in much the same way you are extraordinary. She does a million things and never feels like she's doing enough. I'm Meredith Colby. I support voice teachers to create confident teaching and singing of popular styles. I'm the author of Money Notes, introduces Neural Vocal Method, a way to teach and sing popular styles based on brain science. Hi, Marlies. Uh, your undergraduate was in international studies and diplomacy, but then your graduate degree was in vocal performance. So I'd grown up singing and performing, but when I went to college, I thought I would go into the foreign service, but I didn't realize that wasn't for me, but it was too late. It was too late to stop the train. So <laughs> I ended up graduating, worked a little bit and got married, started having kids. And um, my husband, he was, uh, he's part Hawaiian and, and he was raised here. So when we moved to Hawaii, um, I had two young kids at home and I realized that I just needed to get back into performing. Doing the Hawaii Opera Theater, being in the chorus and uh, started singing and taking lessons and doing all, all of that. But when my husband went through a career change, now we have four kids, we ended up taking all four kids to South Dakota and they have an amazing music program there. If you want to go into a vocal performance, we could get you could do your masters and we can fund you. So how do you say no to that? You don't. My masters really gave me a little bit more foundation in classical, Western classical music, which I didn't really quite understand. I thought I was, you know, you just think I'm learning music. I'm learning how to sing, how to perform. And so that was a great influence as I started teaching. So I was teaching singing how I had been trained to sing. For you, Marlise, master's in perform vocal performance, you have your own voice studio, and you have four kids. All four are still at home. All four. And you also have made time to be in some community theater productions, and, and you're with an international dance group as well. So this is what I think is kind of amazing, and a lot of us are trying to spin all those plates. And we don't always feel like we're living up to our own desires or expectations. I know that you started your teaching because you were just sort of thrown in the deep end as a master's student. I taught um, non-music major undergraduates. I had a really great teacher there and professor, and I did take a voice science class. So I had some kind of foundation. I started teaching there and then continued as I moved back to Hawaii. Yeah, I have a practice now. I teach um, a couple of group classes. I teach private lessons. Yeah, I have about 15 students right now, so a small studio. Well, for me, you know, it's, you, you see other teachers who have big full studios, and I think I just had my 15, but for right now, that's really about all I can handle. You just said you see other teachers who have big full studios, and you then you have 15, and you think that's all you can handle. And I look at 15 and I go, that's to me, that's a full studio. <laughs> Why do you think you, we do that to ourselves? I don't know, just the expectation of if I'm going to have a studio and if I'm going to put all this work into it, especially as an independent voice teacher, you know, you, you want as much reach as you can. Also having a family, also being able, able to perform when I want to and when I can and running the business, everything takes time. The business part takes a lot more time than I ever anticipated. I had never run a business before, so just learning how to do that, how to do invoicing, you know, how to onboard my students, you know, getting all the information out. All of that takes time before I even get to the teaching part. When you're an indie teacher, the business part takes time and energy and focus and you have to learn new things. You also have to learn your clientele. Your your clientele, they're not people who necessarily want or need classical training, which is where you came from. Right. When I graduated, I had a very narrow focus of what a good, a good voice teacher was but then it's it's hard to maintain students when you're trying to teach them things that they don't really want to learn so i had to um expand my horizons a little bit be a little more humble i think what really helped i when i joined the um voice teachers for young singers the Facebook nikki group, loney's group i decided to take your course the neuro vocal method so you were saying my people don't want classical and what I'm really good at teaching is classical. Right, so how do you change? I would write down every um, kind of training, everything people mentioned in their comments. I would look at that like, what is that? And I'd research it out. And so I have, I still have a list of all these professional development courses and what I learned about them and which one would apply to me, which one 
did I think would be worth the investment. And I always loved musical theater. I did musical theater a lot, but a lot of the legit stuff because I could never sing more of the contemporary things. I love like Aretha Franklin, Gladys Knight in the Pit. You know, I love these things, but I could never sing it. And I, I was scared to try. There was a whole lot of anxiety around how to teach my students something that I wasn't very familiar with. You took my class. How do you feel now? I really had a paradigm shift when I took your class. It was just the idea of uh, classical music being composer driven versus contemporary microphone styles being artist driven. Never, never occurred to me when you understand that, like it takes all the judgment away. All of this was like a huge weight off my shoulders. It wasn't that classical music and teaching training was wrong or right. It was just genre specific. The most amazing thing was I can listen to the radio and not be judgmental. That singer is not very good. That's not using very good technique. Enjoy it for what it's worth and feel that connection. <laughs> my life is happier in a lot of ways because um, I can teach this music that I, that I also really enjoy. Rita Castillo says, that was a great shift for me too, the classic versus contemporary, which is interesting because Rita, she's a band singer. So, but, but we still get this idea in our heads that things are right and wrong. And if we can reframe it, we're much freer. So what's happened with your performing? I've just been able to get out of my comfort zone a little bit. Right. I just did a local Christmas show, a variety show, saying a little bit different um, I have in the past. You know, it's just, it's fun. I enjoy it. And then once I know how to access how, how they can sing in a healthy manner, an efficient manner, and it can really be them, right? I can really hear their voice. It's very exciting. It's fun to me. Teaching has become a lot more fun. We're going to bring it back to our theme, which was the balancing act. Is it more fun, less stressful, easier to teach now that you're not stuck in this classical way of being? Yes. It yes. is. I mean, we're looking for ways to change our thinking a little bit so that things are easier, more fun, more balanced in our lives, more comfortable with teaching popular styles, which is what you have said your students want. For sure, um, because they're choosing music that they want to sing, which means they, they come better prepared, which means it's more fun overall. Because before it was me picking out the music or picking out a couple different options and them choosing and them not, which do I hate the least, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's still work in teaching, but it's more fun and I feel more fulfilled doing it. I, I take off that that weight of knowing everything and only teaching a certain way. And that was the other thing too, like more of emphasis on your class of um, walking with someone, helping guide them other than having this uh, master apprentice. Instead of me feeling like I should know this, I should know this, why don't I know this? Like, what do I do? You know, just being able to say, you know, let me, let me look into that or let me think about that. I'm still learning too. My students trust me when I do that because then they know that I'm not, I'm not, trying to make something up. And then do you have more energy for your performing? Do you find time for performing, which I think is amazing? Uh, I think this is really important. So I need to perform to balance myself. And this is where it gets tricky with having a family, right? Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm teaching, there's this part, I'm performing. And I struggled for years and years and years um, of feeling like it was selfish to take time away from my family, right? To do something that I love you know, go to these rehearsals for hours and be with theater people and perform music, you know, and disrupts our schedule. And it, there's a lot of sacrifice that uh, my family makes so I can perform. But having said that, like, it's, I uh, also feel like it's a respect thing because I sacrifice a lot for my family and my kids to get to the things that they want to go to. And, um, you know, there's just shows and things that I don't do because to me, it's not worth it. And because when I perform and it balances me, I really do feel like I'm a better spouse. I'm a better mom. I'm a better friend. You know, I'm happier overall. So uh, it, it's just trying to find the balance. And so I don't feel like it's selfish anymore. And the other thing with that, I, I would say to those that are balancing all this, is it was really important for me even getting my graduate degree because I did it at such a late age. It was really important for my kids to see me struggle, to learn that you're continually learning and you're continually running it up against things that you've never done before, that you are not that great at, right? And you just keep 
and you can cry. It's okay to cry. And it's okay to have, you know, down days, but you just pick yourself up and keep doing it. And that was really important to me. It's good for our kids to see us struggle and to get over that. We're parents and our kids tend to only see us as parents, but we are professionals and we want to be better at what we do. You want to be a better actor, singer. You want to be a better teacher. We need to learn new things and we need to improve what we're doing. I love professional development. Like I love, I love, because I love learning new things. I love ideas. Yeah, I have a running list, books, recommendations, podcasts, things I want to look up and research of different courses and things. And I research them all and figure out which ones that I want to invest in and and then do those and then see how it applies things. Oh, and whatever I use in my studio, like applies to me as a performer. So, you oh, know, yeah. I get a double dose, right? Of, yeah, yeah, that's like, true. I'm trying out all these things as I do it anyway, right? So I feel like I grow as a performer, but also as a teacher. Part of, of my earnings will always go back to um, professional development. Is that how you right? do it? Do you do you set aside a certain amount of money? My mom would always say, um, you're in a season of your life, right? You're in a season and this too shall pass when things get frustrating, but also this too shall pass and you'll never get it back. So even though my time may be limited in many ways right now, um, I'm just building because I know that in the next few years, it'll maybe lighten up a little bit. And I know in five years, uh, our family dynamics are going to be a little bit different. In the beginning, when I first started, I was a little frustrated. Like, I don't have the time to do everything I want to right now, but I can do those little baby steps over a long period of time. And um, by the time I'm ready to expand my studio, well, then I'll have all of this knowledge and all this training built up. That's a gem. The things we're doing right now can affect the goals we might have for ourselves five or even 10 years down the line. Right. And we can be intentional about that. That's the key word, intentional. Like I may only have time for one class this year. I may spend $600 or I may spend $1,500 on professional development this year. And it's my only class I'm going to take, but I'm taking a class and it's going right. to count. Five years from now, that class will still count. But I think what you just said about being intentional about it and knowing that you're accumulating the knowledge, it's much more empowering. I knew where I wanted to be and it was so frustrating not being able to spend all the time, all the money, everything to, to achieve that. But this makes it more empowering. Like I will get there. I will. Do you set aside a certain amount of time and or money every year? I do set aside money. And sometimes if I can't do everything, I may do this and with a couple extra books and you know, this instead of these two courses that I really want to do. It'll still, it'll still be there. The greatest lesson I learned about my family was um, when I was going to grad school, getting my master's, my husband was going through a career change. So he was also a master's student and we had four kids and we both had graduate teaching assistantships. And wow. it, our kids were going to four different schools, you know, different places. And it was so hard. And then what happened when a child got sick? My husband and I were like, okay, who can miss class today? Who can miss work? <laughs> and so that taught me an important lesson. Like for my family and my situation, I just, I did not want to work full time. So when we moved back to Hawaii, that's when I said, I want to, I want to teach, but I just want to do it part time. Could I expand my studio? Yes. Could I be doing more performing? Yeah. I could be doing a whole lot more that I actually, I would love to do. But I, I don't because I know it would be too much. I just have to point out that you took neurovocal certification during lockdown. You made time for that during lockdown. And was that because of the nature of the class? Was that because you really wanted it? What, what made you decide to do that? I really wanted to learn how to teach contemporary microphone styles. It was on my list. I wanted to do it. That one was easy because I, I didn't have to leave my house and I didn't have to leave my family. Still impressive though. You are able to say, all these things are important. Performing, teaching in my family, and professional development. So you're able to just say a little bit of each. And I'm guessing you've also trained your kids to be a little more self-reliant. I couldn't do this without an amazingly supportive husband. When I say, ooh, there's something going on, you know, there's a show and he's like, do it, you should do it. It's made me better be more clear in how I communicate, communicate that to my husband. Sometimes I have to say, I need you to do this and I can't tell you how. He does. And my kids, I'll tell them, I can't 
do this. I can help you at another time. Yeah, they have to be more self-reliant because of that. But on the other hand, like I sing to my boys every night, my two little boys, you know, I read to them and you know, it, it just all is, a, it's a balancing act, but I don't want to miss that. That is not always going to be my life. And no way do I want to throw that out the window to do a show. Not to be on stage, but I need to be, I need to be with my family too. Yeah. 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 Just moments don't last. It's, so. it's a balancing act. Thank you, Marlies. Bye everybody.